Well, once again, welcome to this month's Ask Your Herb Doctor. My name's Andrew Murray. My name's Sarah Johannesson Murray. For those of you who perhaps have never listened to the show, they run every third Friday of the month from 7 till 8 p.m. Uh, we're both licensed uh, medical herbalists. Uh, we practice here in uh, Northern California. Uh, we see a wide range of people and increasingly are consulting with people uh, by telephone across the country. Um, as usual, uh, it's become very popular and uh, I say almost indispensable because of the wealth of information and the uh, alternative approach to the same subjects that uh, we felt we knew at one point in time, but is certainly getting a re-education. Uh, we'll be joined by Dr. Raymond Peake, PhD, uh, who spent the last 40 years um, in research, uh, providing a wealth of newsletters. Uh, he's written several books. It's probably more like 50 years now. <laughs> And he doesn't sell anything, so that's the kind of neat thing. He's uh, very altruistic, and uh, I know from just personally how much time he gives freely uh, in terms of me asking him questions about various clients with uh, getting his perspective uh, and his insight onto it. Uh, and also, I've heard from hundreds of people uh, from all over the country and all around the world, uh, from people from Australia, from Europe, uh, Canada, uh, who have t written to me and said that they uh, either got responses from him or they consulted uh, in the past with him. And some people have, you know, talked about twenty or thirty years, and they've been uh, following uh, what he's been advocating. So, we're always very pleased to have him on the show. Uh, there is something new I wanted to make sure that people that are listening to the show tonight uh, take note of because the call-in number has changed. So. Uh, I'm looking at this new temporary call-in number. Uh, it used to be 923-3911, but the temporary number here is now 777. Well, we got a 707 area code. Yeah, 707 area code. Uh, that's if you're in the area. 777-5397. Uh, uh, I still imagine there is a 1-800 number. They haven't said anything about that changing, and I'll confirm that with the... Uh, yeah, we think that's probably still the same. <laughs> that's one 800 Five six eight three seven two three, one eight hundred five six eight three seven two three. That's eight hundred KMUD RAD. So the uh, regular number for people in the area, the seven zero seven number again, and I'll call this out again a bit later is seven 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 five three nine seven. So from seven thirty until the end of the show, eight o'clock, you're invited to call in with any questions related to this month's subject of exploring the precautionary principle. And uh, uh, people are welcome to call in uh, regarding the show, or if they have other questions, uh, Dr. Raymond Peake is always very uh, very keen to answer questions, and uh, he's always got a, he's always has a, uh, a remedy or an explanation, uh, even for the strangest questions. So not that you should ask strange questions to test him, but anyway, so I just want to open the show... Uh, I did a little bit of digging around this morning, uh, knowing that the subject uh, was going to be this, uh, this, this phrase, precautionary principle. So the, the term cautionary or precautionary principle is not a new concept, uh, has its roots in antiquity and is the maxim supporting the heritage of herbal medicine, first to do no harm. Uh, the Hippocratic Oath by which all practitioners of medicine still swear allegiance is the same and its meaning remains unchanged, though modern practices have swerved off the road and are far from on the straight and narrow path leading to safe and effective medicines which we could all benefit from in this time of knowledge. We know the Greek legend of Pandora and her box once opened and in the world it could never be put back in and the price to humanity was great. So I ask you the question... Why does nature not come up with the best way forward and why do we seek to usurp it rather than learn from it and use it as a guide as we should? Now, there are some good scientists do, no doubt, uh, but we live in a world ruled by greed and power especially over others and are far from a universally altruistic state. Uh, GMOs, for example, are very contentious <coughs> and uh, it completely defies logic to have Chernobyls and Fukushimas all over the planet with waste lasting millennia and weapons of truly mass destruction with us always. Pandora's box was open for sure, but we are lured by the potential of virtually limitless clean energy by fusion reaction. Uh, 
as we are by the lies uh, that the GMO scientists foster regarding feeding the starving planet's population. Uh, the precautionary principle as applied to medicines and foods can be seen in Europe where it is codified into law, uh, but purposely not here in the US. This is up for discussion, and whilst not a political show, uh, the politics of nations with their attendant, controlling, vested interests and lobbyists most definitely are implicated in the lack thereof. Now, the World Charter for Nature, adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1982, was the first international endorsement of the precautionary principle, and the principle was implemented in an international treaty as early as 1987, and the Montreal Protocol, and among other international treaties and declarations, is reflected in the 1992 Rio Declaration on Environment and Development, signed at the UN Conference on Environment and Development. Now, the United States has opposed the use of the term principle, uh, because this term has special connotations in legal language, due to the fact that a principle of law is a source of law. Now, this is the legal status of the precautionary principle in the European Union, And it has informed much EU policy, including areas beyond environmental policy, down to general product safety, the use of additives for use in animal nutrition, the incineration of waste, and the regulation of genetically modified organisms. And another point, as I have mentioned, the nuclear industry is Chris Busby's article, uh, which we'll get into later, and the invocation in Europe of the Euratom suicide clause. So without much uh, further ado, Dr. Pete, uh, are you with us? Yep. Thanks so much for joining us again. We do appreciate your uh, giving your time. Um, So getting into the uh, precautionary principle, and I know we have covered, um, you know, the the concept, uh, the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm, medical fraud, etc. But what what is it um, we wanted to bring out here with the precautionary principle, given that it's law in Europe and it's not here, and let's go and uh, start this discussion by opening up with uh, where you are most um, uh, most intimately concerned with this for the good of change. Um, j- just after I got out of graduate school and was uh, doing uh, consulting and, and practical uh, projects, uh, people were talking about uh, whether uh, natural uh, remedies were any better than uh, pharmaceutical, chemical remedies. And uh, that started me thinking about uh, what the difference really is. And uh, a substance such as uh, progesterone, I think, is a good illustration. Uh, just yesterday, someone asked me, uh, told me the story of uh, his wife being prescribed a new synthetic uh, progestin. Uh, I looked up some articles on it, and they described it as being designed to resemble as closely as possible the natural molecule progesterone. And uh, a couple other molecules in the last uh, 10 years or so have claimed that they are closer than any of the other synthetic progestins to natural progesterone. And uh, uh, that is uh, very interesting that progesterone has existed in animals uh, since animals uh, began and uh, these other substances in in the case of this recent one it has existed in the universe only for 10 years and uh, so we pretty well know that natural progesterone is safe because it it has been doing its thing in organisms forever absolutely but this yeah. new one if it uh, it, it has a, a group on it, a cyanide group, uh, that uh, never was attached to a, a natural steroid molecule. Uh, so it's undoubtedly doing uh, many things that natural progesterone doesn't do. But how soon will we know what the ultimate side effects of this uh, historically unique intervention in the organism what will they be a uh, uh, hundred years from now in the descendants of the people who are being treated with it now? Right. And why uh, did they put the cyanide on there? Is that to make it a patentable medicine? Uh, that, that's part of it, yeah. The, the, uh, 
they are making things as close to progesterone as they can, but they can't patent progesterone, so they, they have something as close to it as they can get. But the actual uh, natural substance is cheap, and the drug companies aren't interested in uh, promoting something with very little profit because everyone can compete. Um, when you use herbal uh, remedies, uh, the, um, even if there is one specific active agent uh, that you're looking for, uh, uh, like in a, a foxglove, mm-hmm. the uh, digitalis type uh, uh, effect, uh, you're uh, not only uh, going to have supporting surrounding metabolites that are acting somewhat uh, like drugs, but you know that that natural form of the molecule has existed in plant cells uh, since the plant uh, became what it is. And the the, the fact is that the uh, structure and the biochemistry of plant and animal cells is very similar. Uh, We have uh, the same basic types of enzymes and energy-producing reactions. Photosynthesis is the main difference between plants and animals. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, movement, uh, animals have specialized movement systems, but for the basic chemistry, uh, plants are, are very parallel to animals. And so we know that those molecules are compatible with at least many kinds of life. Um, where if you invent a molecule, uh, it might seem very similar, but you really can't know until uh, you have tried it for the whole lifetime of a particular organism. Um, and uh, in the case of uh, diethylstilbestrol, DES, um, it was introduced as an estrogen uh, to treat uh, uh, menopause and to improve pregnancy. <laughs> it was called the female hormone, and so uh, the argument was that if you were having trouble carrying a pregnancy, uh, that was because something was uh, defective in your femaleness, so they gave you more of the female hormone. And... Uh, there were already many things known about the harm of the molecule at that time, but uh, it was given to millions of women, and it, uh, 20 or 30 years later, they were seeing that the uh, children, both male and female, and the, even the grandchildren, apparently, hmm. have been uh, injured by their mother's use of this synthetic estrogen. Mm. Um, so the, um, that shows that the, the um, <clears throat> development of sickness, which uh, in the case of cancer, an individual might not show the uh, fact that they've got cancer from an exposure to a chemical, might be 40 years after the exposure uh, so with a six-month animal study, you aren't going to have a clue as to whether it might cause uh, cancer in the old age of, of the person who uses it, or even in their children or grandchildren. And now the uh, uh, in the last uh, 15 or 20 years, the idea of epigenetic change mm-hmm. has been accepted. And uh, the uh, what you do to one individual is now recognized to have the effects several generations into the future. Um, And one of those common effects, which is now recognized as uh, a type of epigenetic change or damage, is called uh, genomic instability, uh, where even the DNA, which might not be mutated in the first a day or week or year of exposure, but the genome itself becomes destabilized even in subsequent generations so that uh, there are mutations 
uh, being created in later generations from an early exposure. Um, estrogen and uh, ionizing radiation have many overlapping uh, similarities. Uh, you can get a synergy between a, a certain dose of radiation and a certain dose of energy of, of uh, estrogen, which is uh, more than additive. Uh, you, it's like adding uh, extra radiation to an X-ray if you have uh, an exposure already to estrogen. Right. So it's like a potentiating effect. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let me uh, let me just uh, expand this uh, concept of the precautionary uh, principle. So just uh, for people that are listening, I hadn't actually. Um, I must admit, I hadn't actually heard of this specific principle and didn't recognize that actually it was a um, a point in law, written into law in the European Union, um, so that um, what, it, what it seeks to do, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seeks, seeks to bring a, uh, a real legal action into play against uh, malfeasant uh, activities perpetrated by different companies who would bring a product to market um, and subsequently harm people because they either didn't do enough testing or they covered up the testing and we'll get into the fraud side of uh, medicine, which is fairly well known um, in terms of how prevalent it is. Uh, but that this law there actually protects, um, well, I guess it protects people that have been hurt and injured and or the covers the cost of environmental cleanup. And I did notice that a lot of it initially was aimed at environmental um, effects, the degrada degradative effects of uh, whatever substance that was leaked into the environment, um, polluted rivers, etc., etc. So initially there was a lot of environmental things, and I think the Earth Summit, etc., uh, was um, you know, the, the, the forbearer of what later uh, became, not through lack of being initiated in the beginning, but from a uh, rollover effect, uh, became things to involve uh, medicines, uh, food safety, um, you know, very many different things that you would come into contact with as an organism yourself and maybe not be directly responsible for, but were, uh, you know, exposed to it from the companies producing it. So that you, there is a direct recourse in law. But the American, uh, and I'm not saying this is wrong, and I'm really not saying one is uh, better, uh, better than the other, but uh, what I'd like you to bring out later is the benefit of the uh, obvious um, results of careful testing, careful planning, uh, true scientific evaluation of the facts, not covering up any skewed uh, results to put your product in a bad light, but being totally honest. And I think this is where all of the concept of fraud and damage and claims and insurance and all the things that put up the cost of everything to everybody because it's all additive in its own right, um, it's really just down to dishonesty at the heart of it all. If I think if you look at um, why these things happen and why GlaxoSmithKline pay out $36 billion in reparations for drugs, and that's just one of them, and I think about things like Vioxx, uh, and uh, other companies that have produced drugs that have been shown to give sudden death or uh, they give people dementia or whatever it is, you know, it's a harmful effect. And so the whole tenet of first do no harm uh, has got to be the most important thing. And that really goes hand in hand with being totally honest and being scientific about what you're doing so that you're open to scrutiny. It's uh, thrown out there, it's peer reviewed, etc. And the results are what the results are, and you move forward, and that's how real progress is made. I'm not saying that a lot of times things uh, can be born out of mistakes uh, and, and turn out to produce better things, but um, in terms of the precautionary principle and European law covering that, and we'll get into the... Uh, uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, this character uh, Busby, Chris Busby in England, um, he's basically bringing this what they call the Euratom suicide clause and we'll bring out here a little bit later on just how many more deaths have now been attributed to uh, radioactive uh, waste 
either from Sellafield in England, uh, radioactive uh, material being incinerated and or dumped into the oceans, uh, washed up on the shores, big leukemia incidences, uh, whether it's Chernobyl and all the people dying there of thyroid cancer, uh, whether it's uh, in Japan from Nagasaki and Hiroshima and how that all brought out uh, what the effects of radiation were, and the American government definitely downplayed it so they could maintain research. But what he said now, and again, we'll get into this a bit later on, but he said that ultimately it's almost 150 times the relative uh, uh, risk uh, that was given in the uh, in the um, in the in the publication that um, showed this, so that it was more like 90,000 people a year are dying as a direct result of Hiroshima, Hiroshima and Nagasaki annually. It's not like a one-time thing. It's an annual event. And it's ultimately, it's, man, you know, it's, it's complete and out corporate manslaughter. And so he wants to try and through the European court, uh, ultimately bring around the uh, the end of uh, <laughs> radioactive uh, waste being dumped and whole nuclear power stations being a thing of the past and you know, nuclear energy being a thing of the past. So, I just wanted to get back to the medicines, Dr. Wheaton. You mentioned if these some of these drugs are causing genetic problems and cancers 40 years later and then in the grandchildren of mothers who took synthetic estrogen-type drugs whilst pregnant... How can drug companies test these products safely? I mean, would they have seen some pro- problems within a reasonable amount of time in animal studies? Um, yeah, in the, by the 1930s, uh, years before the uh, estrogens came on the pharmaceutical market, they were already identified as very potent carcinogens and uh, uh, promoters of uh, uh, brain defects, um, movement disorders, uh, uh, personality changes, uh, in- inflammation of practically all tissue, uh, cancer development in every organ of the body, not just the uh, the breast and uterus, but uh, brain, kidney, lung, uh, bowel, uh, all, all types of uh, cancer were already known at, at the time that these came on the market, and that they were uh, abortifacient, hmm. uh, estrogen, was uh, clearly identified uh, before 1940 as a powerful uh, birth control or actually uh, early abortifacient. And uh, despite that, it was sold for um, almost 20 years to prevent miscarriage, exactly the opposite of what it was known to actually do. Uh, So the the fraud was uh, the driving force behind the whole uh, estrogen replacement therapy, so-called. Hmm. Uh, it, it started with the knowledge that it was, uh, in many cases, doing exactly the opposite of what they were selling it to do. But what do you think about new drugs that they might not have that knowledge? I mean, do you think uh, there's ways well, to safely test them? Um, yeah, often they still uh, currently have the knowledge and hide it uh, right. or don't want to look for it. If someone suspects that it, it might have a, a certain kind of effect, uh, they will carefully avoid in uh, their applications for approval. Right. Uh, they will avoid uh, discussion of the uh, mechanisms that could cause it to be harmful. Uh, the the whole DNA revolution, uh, it happens that... Uh, there were changes in the way people were thinking about the nature of science uh, at the same time that the uh, uh, biology was being uh, uh, shifted over to a, a study of the DNA molecule uh, rather than actual uh, the facts of, of inheritance. And uh, I, I see it as a, a coordinated uh, uh, effort uh, sponsored by the government to um, support industry in its ability to evade responsibility. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you just look at ordinary liability... We look at vaccines. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the ordinary liability principles in law would make it impossible for many many of these industries to function. Right. Uh, the, the insurance needed 
for a nuclear plant <laughs> would be uh, prohibitive. Uh, the insurance needed uh, for vaccines and for many drugs. Well, they're indemnified, aren't they, for vaccines? They're legally indemnified and well, held he's unblameable. Saying. He's yeah. saying that because the insurance would be so great. Right, right, right. They're just... They get and, off without having to get any insurance. Yeah, and, and uh, even without putting this explicitly into the law as indemnification uh, beforehand, uh, the cleanup projects of the great uh, chemical uh, contaminants around the country. Uh, these are being done at public taxpayer expense rather than yeah. holding the, the profiting corporations responsible for the full cost of cleanup. Wow, so it's a win-win situation for the offending corporations and a lose-lose for the taxpayers and the general population. Yeah. Great. Well, you're listening to Ask Your Web, Dr. KMUD Garberville, 91.1 FM, uh, from 7.30 till the end of the show. Callers are welcome to call in with any questions, uh, either related or this or unrelated to this month's subject of the precautionary principle. Uh, there's a number in the uh, 707 area that's changed, and it's 707-777-5397. If you're on the web and you're listening and you're in different countries, like we've had people phoning from Australia. And well, actually, they'll have to call us. a <laughs> seven number. <laughs> okay. But I'm just pointing out the country, a, there is an 800 number, and I think uh, some people have tried the Skype number, but I'm not too sure if that is available. But anyway, there's an 800 number. It's 800 568 3723. And um, obviously, the show can be downloaded uh, any time after the end of the show for people that are in uh, you know different countries or different time zones and they want to uh, hear the full content of the show so uh, dr p uh, where are we going let's have a think here the last the last things we were talking about uh, in terms of an indemnification uh, of these corporate corporations basically being protected by the government and the government being bought out by lobbyists. I think that's a very important point uh, that adds to the fact that America did not sign on to this precautionary principle. Um, uh, yeah, the, the um, government not only is, is working for the, uh, the corporations in their immediate uh, uh, liabilities, protecting them, uh, but... Uh, if you go back to uh, the late 1930s again and the 1940s, uh, even the, the very nature of the way science is done uh, and uh, the philosophy of science, of what explains uh, the goodness of science, the government has uh, intervened in ways that support this irresponsibility of the corporations. Mm -hmm. uh, the if you look at uh, ancient science from Aristotle's time on uh, down to the, about the, the 19th century, you see that cause and effect were uh, central ideas. And around the middle of the last century, people started uh, saying that uh, with the, um, the quantum uh, physics ideas, uh, they were starting to question whether a cause and effect is a real <laughs> thing. And uh, that's very nice for the polluting yeah, corporation. I bet. I bet. <laughs> but uh, there are people now, uh, foundations and uh, lawyers hired by corporations going oh, around the goodness. country uh, denying uh, the common sense idea of cause and effect and saying that if you uh, claim that this is dangerous, the, the thing that we are selling you, mm -hmm. you have to prove absolutely that you are being harmed by it or killed by it or whatever. Now you're saying this is the get-out clause that America has in terms of its uh, policy. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. putting all the responsibility yeah. on the consumer yeah. or the victim. Yeah, interesting. Actually, yeah. Let, let and, the, and then you have to have enough money and enough time and manpower to fight it. Let me just hold that thought one second, Dr. Peter. I don't mean to in interrupt you, but we did get somebody calling in. So let's take this caller and see where we're going with this call. Where are you from, caller? What's your question? Uh, hi, my name is Jeremy. I'm calling from Atlanta. At Atlanta, Georgia? Or? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Cool. What's your question, Jeremy? Well, I had a, a question that's a little off topic uh, for Dr. Pete. Um, it's uh, about progesterone um, and uh, my wife. Um, we've been, um, we've been poofa free for about two years now, and uh, we've been trying to kind of overcome her estrogen dominance. She's 32, and uh, she's been struggling with, you know, estrogen dominance 
um, you know, ever since she was uh, probably about eight when she hit puberty. Right. She's had really inconsistent uh, periods and, and all that. Um, her uh, waking temp in the morning had been at 94.9, and wow. just removing the, the poop as we were able to get it up to 97.1. Okay. Um, and then back in, our, uh, back in June, we started doing progesterone uh, with that, and we were following Dr. Lee's uh, progesterone therapy and doing about 100 milligrams a day. And uh, it actually started her cycles up. She was, she was uh, um, not having cycles at all, mm-hmm. and um, they were very erratic. And then they kind of stabilized into a very short two-week cycle, and uh, she was very consistent but had a lot of PMS symptom, um, symptoms still. So I started doing more research on it and found out that some women were doing like 700 milligrams a day or more. Mm-hmm. So we, they were using their symptoms to, die, to, to dose. So we started doing the same thing using a 10% topical cream. And uh, she's currently taking 900 milligrams per day, which we broke up into three 300 milligram doses. This is topically. So she, she's doing it at each meal, and she's been doing that since October. Yeah. And that's topical. And it's topical. Okay. Yeah. And is that, are you cycling it two weeks on, two weeks off? No, because she's still continuing her two week cycle. Um, so she hasn't even been having any sort of. Well, until the past the past month. Um, when the two-week cycle starts, she actually won't, the, the flow never begins. She'll spot for three or four days, and then it stops. And so it's like, it's like something is starting to tip with it. But I, I was concerned because that seems like an incredibly high dose. We've also been doing thyroid as well. She's been doing, uh, we've been doing desiccated beef thyroid. She's been doing 40-milligram tablets, and we had slowly ramped up to the point where we are now where she's doing one an hour. For uh, for twelve hours out of the day, one forty milligram, one forty milligram desiccated thyroid tablet. You're saying, mm-hmm. hmm, that's quite a bit. Dr. P, what do you, what do you think about this uh, two week cycle, and what do you think about that amount of uh, uh, thyroid glandular uh, and, and topical progesterone? Hmm. Uh, it, yeah, depending on what the vehicle is, uh, sometimes only a very tiny fraction, five percent or less, sometimes of the progesterone used right. topically is actually getting into the body. Uh, so it's really important to, to check, uh, have a blood test once in a while. Uh, and the, the liver uh, is always uh, regulating the hormones. And when you, when you uh, are using progesterone uh, all month, the liver uh, develops over the first two weeks, uh, the ability to excrete it quickly. And so the, the following weeks, uh, you're uh, excreting it uh, almost as fast as you can put it in. And the natural cycle has a rest of, of two weeks where the liver resets itself so that a, a small amount being uh, produced or absorbed will have a full effect and then after about two weeks, the liver will start uh, excreting it uh, faster, so its effect is reduced. So that's why we recommend that you take an internal progesterone, like the Progest-D that you can find on the Internet, and then cycle it from full moon to new moon, and then stop from new moon to full moon. And then hopefully you'll get into a cycle where you're ovulating at the full moon. That's when you start your Progest-D, and then you take that until new moon, which then you should have a period. Okay. And the um, thyroid products are extremely variable. Um, it's important to um, watch for uh, changes in your temperature and pulse rate and uh, many other indicators like the color of lips uh, and uh, uh, warmth of the fingers, uh, uh, the uh, quality of sleep and uh, digestion. And usually... Low thyroid, high estrogen people have uh, uh, digestive problems. Uh, The uh, estrogen tends to recycle when your thyroid is low. It uh, is reabsorbed after being excreted into the intestine by the liver. It's reabsorbed and uh, keeps the uh, level high even when you aren't producing it. And and so... uh, Fiber in the diet, a raw carrot every day, uh, sometimes is enough to uh, get the estrogen down to the point that the cycles are normalized. 
and especially the combination of, of a daily raw carrot and uh, thyroid enough to keep your pulse and temperature up. And if you want a temperature and pulse chart so you can chart it out and see what you're getting up to with your temperatures and pulses 15 to 90 minutes after eating breakfast and lunch, you can email us and we'll gladly send that to you so that you can have a look at it and it has the normal values of what you should be reaching. Because 97.1 is an okay waking temperature, but after you eat, it should go up to at least 98.2 to 98.6 or 99. Yeah, she's been hitting um, 90, you know, uh, 97, 9, 98 um, after eating. And um, and her temperature has been slowly, her waking temperature has been slowly rising. She actually hit 97.5 this morning. So I, it seems like everything's moving in a positive direction. We are doing the raw carrot every day as well. We have been for about three months. Okay. And um, it, that's why I was just concerned because I know I've heard you talk about much lower doses of these things you know, causing effects, and I was just worried that, you know, we're doing this really high dosing, and it does seem to be working. There's no negative side effects, but it certainly seems like there should have been more substantial improvement you in know, that I, period of time. I, I, I do find there's a very wide range of uh, um, dose that people report back saying they use this much, they use that much. Um, it does happen even with herbs, um, it, well, especially with things like cascara in terms of how much it takes uh, to elicit uh, an easy bowel movement. And there are plenty of other herbs out there that some people uh, quite easily consume, you know, 15 mil a day, uh, and other people don't need anywhere near as much uh, to get the same response. Things like valerian for sleep, it really wakes some people up, you know. So it is it's very variable physiologically of how people react to things. Uh, Dr. Pete, what do you think about the uh, 40 milligrams of desiccated every hour um, what would the total be in the 24 hour period well, they, i think he said 12 hours every, every once, 12 hours. A, once an hour for 12 hours so uh see here. 480 480 milligrams. yeah um i've known people who who needed that much of mm. even armor thyroid what's uh, that about like six grains um, yeah, that's uh, no, eight make a five grain tablet of armor, and uh, even uh, veterinarians would routinely prescribe that much for a, a, a cocker spaniel that weighed thirty pounds. <laughs> and uh, I've known people who needed one or two of those regularly, uh, so it, it isn't unheard of to mm-hmm. need that much. But uh, it's important to uh, watch for the signs. Yeah. yeah, and also, too, uh, products can be different. 40 milligrams of this beef glandular could be very different than 40 milligrams of armor thyroid. Gotcha. The main so thing you're saying the, the signs to be looking for, I mean, uh, what we did to, to find the dosing level was basically we had been ramping it up until she began to get nauseous, you know, from taking it, and yeah, then we backed it back down from there, yeah, that's and that's unusual. kind of where we settled. Yeah, that's and kind of unusual. So it, Everything else seems to be fine. I mean, she's not having any negative side effects at all. Yeah. Everything is functioning. She feels healthy. Well, I know the things that Dr. Pete always points out that are symptoms of over uh, overdosing, overconsumption, would be things like sweating uh, with very minimal exercise, uh, breathlessness with minimal exercise. Um, a di- Excessive appetite. Overheating during strenuous exercise. Well, not strenuous even, but just... I and, a just pul- and a pulse over 100. You haven't yeah. mentioned what her pulse is. Um, it's been in the uh, mid-80s most yeah. of the time. Yeah. Yeah, well, you never know. Here's the other thing with glandulars is uh, it's such a variable product, like Dr. Pete says, you know. Uh, I think you could take a dozen different glandular extracts and find different amounts within the same milligram dose of, uh, you know, of, a, of a glandular. So um, that's, I think some in some part a uh, a reason to advocate synthetics just because they are very finely measured so an armor thyroid might be a better solution then uh well armor should be quantified yeah it should be there should be a spec sheet that comes with it that will tell you that there are this many uh, micrograms of t3 and t4 and what it would uh, you know what that ratio would be should be an ideal ratio okay Great. Well, uh, we'll give those things a shot. I really appreciate um, the show. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, you're and, welcome. Thanks for your And call. Dr. Pete, thank you. Uh, you've really changed our lives, and I really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you for your call. Um, I- one more thing for that listener is 
you know, if she was going to start taking the progesterone internally, she'd probably want to start with like an eighth of a teaspoon yeah. so once a day and right. then maybe go up to twice a day. And an eighth of a teaspoon of progesterone has 50 milligrams of progesterone in but it. But you know you absorb it pretty much but you, it, Yeah, so. and if you keep it in your mouth. And, and the cycling is very important, yeah. two weeks off every month. There you go. That should help her use it a lower dose more effectively. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so we have another caller on the air. So, caller, where are you from and what's your question? Hi, I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area. Hey, what's your question? And I have uh, two questions. Uh, one, what can a man do to reverse male pattern baldness? And then two, how can someone heal or improve a lower back herniated disc? Dr. Pete, male pattern but baldness is the first question. Um. It's often associated with uh, low thyroid function, and uh, so for your general health, uh, you should uh, look at, at the whole picture of, of your cholesterol and uh, body temperature, uh, energy need, calories required, and so on, uh, and uh, specifically for the uh, health of the scalp, uh, there are a, a few simple things. Caffeine, for example, is a good stimulant of hair follicle, uh, hair production, rate of growth, and so on. And, uh, you don't want to put coffee on your on your head, but uh, you can dissolve uh, purified caffeine in rubbing alcohol, for example. And uh, DHEA is, is another uh, natural hormone that sometimes uh, activates uh, hair follicle function. And uh, for uh, connective tissue, and especially the discs, the DHEA and thyroid, again, are, are crucial things. Uh, if thyroid function is low, all of the connective tissues tend to be waterlogged and uh, somewhat soft and uh, lacking resistance and elasticity. And uh, DHEA is uh, sometimes uh, just normalizing your uh, serum level of DHEA, which might only take five milligrams a day. Uh, that can have uh, very quick, dramatic effects on connective tissues, uh, ligaments, tendons, discs, uh, knee cartilage, and so on. You must be careful with DHEA because it can raise your estradiol levels. So you might want to have blood checks to make sure yep. that your estradiol progesterone ratio is good in women and then your testosterone and estrogen ratio is okay for men. Yeah, you want to use uh, DHEA. I think the important thing with DHEA is to make sure that your thyroid function is adequate enough because otherwise then that conversion to estradiol can occur more likely. That, that's, that's correct, isn't it, Dr. Pete? Yep. Yeah. Okay, well, thank, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for your call. Okay, so the uh, number, if you live in the area, 707 number has changed. It's 777-5397, and there's an 800 number. If you're not local, that's 800-568-3723. So anyway, to carry on with the uh, precautionary principle subject of tonight, and I think we're going to have to carry this on next week because I've got lots of other questions here I'd like to ask you, Dr. Pete. Uh, I mean, next month. <laughs> I don't think we're going to get a chance this evening, but anyway, it's all good. Um, in, in terms of the uh, cause and effect... Um, and what has been turned around, if like in this country, whereby the onus is put on the consumer, as it were, to uh, uh, suffer the consequences and then bring to law or bring to court uh, a uh, you know a, a, a suitable case. Um, what do you think uh, could be done that more closely models a European um, uh, perspective in law codifying this precautionary principles without stifling innovation i think i always hear it, and i'm not against it i'm just i'm just trying to want to be bring out a balanced perspective here that in this country and i love america god bless america i really do love it um 
there is an option, uh, an opportunity, a chance, and uh, innovation in this country, I think, is probably probably world-leading. I know there's very brilliant people in China. There's brilliant people in most of Asia. In uh, India. In India, absolutely. You know, So there's been many, many peoples in the world all over. They're brilliant people, and they're brilliant Russians. You know, uh, It's just brilliant people all over um, in many different cultures and countries. But in America... There is this kind of uh, spirit of entrepreneurship and uh, groundbreaking innovation. And, and I always hear the argument, well, that's going to get stifled. If we put too many restrictions on, um, you know, say, uh, drug development that doesn't bring a product to market and it costs all these billions of dollars and, um, you know, it, we're going to stop people from getting involved in this kind of thing. What do we, what do we, and I know that's not the case, but I just want to bring out what you're trying to bring up in terms of, so this is why not. So what have you got to say about the potential of stifling innovation with legislation like European legislation, which tends to be mindlessly bureaucratic? Uh, how does that, how does that uh, get avoided but still have the safety that we would all want to demand from a product as consumers? Um, if the government would just stop stifling the exchange of information, uh, that would... I think it would uh, reduce the need for legislative power and enforcement. Uh, for example, when a, a product, a drug, comes on the market with FDA approval, the FDA should uh, make public all of the information that the drug company had at least, but they uh, let the drug company keep secrets as, as business secrets uh, that very often uh, relate to the safety of the product. Uh, so the, gover- the FDA tends to conspire uh, to keep information away from the public that the public should have complete access to if the government is going to say this is an approved thing that uh, has, has the government support. Okay, because I think I'll bring out a little bit later if we have the time, because we do have a caller, but uh, if we have time, we'll get into this um, revelational piece <laughs> piece of work by this uh, this chap, Chris Busby in England, and uh, what the, he, he hopes to bring to pass is called the Eurotom Suicide Clause, where bas- he's basically going to use the same legislation that Europeans have to bring into law the precautionary principle and apply it to uh, nuclear power stations, and they are going to fall flat on their face with this one because there's nowhere they can defend it. Um, okay, so uh, we have a caller on the air, but let's take this caller. Caller, where are you from? And what's your question? I'm actually from Pepperwood. Pepperwood, okay. So I live locally. Yeah, okay. What's your question? And my question is... Um, I have reached the age of 60, and uh, a colonoscopy is in my, uh, is what everyone tells me I need to have, even though I'm not having any digestive problems. Um, it seems like something that, you know, like, is a test that you're supposed to have, and I'm just not sure. I was wondering what you all thought about that. Dr. Pete, colonoscopy, impossible. Uh uh, revealing carcinoma in the bowel or... And or uh, possible complications. What, yeah, of course. What would you advise, Dr. Pete? Right. It's just, you know, seems like a routine thing. When you reach mm-hmm. a certain age, they want you to have it now, and it seems, you know, like it is. I mean, I know they've done thousands of them, and um, but it seems it is another thing that's invasive, and Absolutely. if your body's not experiencing any problems i'm wondering can you hold off or is this something that's that uh is important i mean i know you want to prevent uh colon cancer but i'm just uh concerned about you know complications of surgery whatnot um my uh, position is is pretty extreme and i urge people to learn as much as they can, but uh, on uh, on colonoscopy, if if there's no radiation involved, it's it's just a a matter of of the mechanics of it and possibly the the toxic effects of any uh, sedative or anesthetic that they might use. 
uh, but uh, I, when when you uh, related to uh, the commonly done uh, CAT scans and uh, various X-ray exams, uh, I would put it on uh, the, po- the potentially uh, justified uh, medical procedure. Uh, while okay. I would exclude almost always uh, the CAT scans and, and uh, radiation exams, uh, uh, the um, basic argument is that uh, they find a certain amount of uh, polyps that are precancerous or even uh, have definite cancer in them that can be removed. Uh, I would uh, just suggest that uh, these, uh, no one really knows the natural history of a polyp because uh, you would have to have a, a colonoscopy every month or so for years to, to watch the actual development of an individual polyp. And uh, I suspect that many polyps, uh, the same way that many uh, uh, skin melanomas, uh, simply uh, fall off and, and go away uh, if you, mm-hmm. uh, without even being noticed. Uh, so uh, there, there's a, a certain ambiguity in the, in the science that's used to justify them. It, in the few areas of the world where almost no one dies of uh, intestinal or rectal cancer, uh, they the, the colonoscopy is not done, so that there it happens that there's a, a close correlation between uh, doing colonoscopies and having colon cancer. Right. I, th- I think the other thing I'd like to bring out, Dr. Pete, to mind me for interrupting, but um, anybody over the age of 50 pretty much uh, will be found to have some carcinoma somewhere in the body on autopsy, correct? Um, yeah. Uh, and um, it, it's been known for um, since at least the 1940s. I think it was in JAMA. Uh, someone published pictures of a, a biopsy made of various types of of superficial injury, uh, cuts or stab wounds and such, and uh, showed that all of the features used to diagnose cancer in a a pathological uh, study, uh, all of these features can be found in an ordinary healing wound. So uh, right from the 1940s, uh, the documentation by uh, biopsy slides and exam by skilled uh, pathologists, all of that has been put into question since all of those features, abnormal uh, cell arrangement, abnormal cell structure and so on, can be found in any healing wound. So if they uh, had mixed up the slides and had someone's biopsy from a healing wound with someone's cancer, cancerous polyp, They'd see the same thing and misdiagnose someone with a healing wound with cancer. Is that what you're saying, basically? Well, it, it implies that uh, if you don't follow that particular tumor or thing that you biopsied, if you cut it out and study it, uh, you don't know whether it was in the process of healing or of not healing. Mm. And so the, the I, I think the rational approach is to do what you can that promotes healing uh, rather than uh, uh, doing a biopsy. When you, when you say that, Dr. Pete, then you mean to eat the right foods for your colon and your basic uh, digestive tract health. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Um, uh, yeah, the areas where they don't get uh, colon cancer, in effect, are uh, areas of Africa where they eat a high-fiber diet. Right. Um, milk and fiber are very protective for the colon. Well, I won't take all of your time. Thank you so much. That um, is really very helpful for me. 
And thank you for your call, Paula. Uh, Dr. Sorry. Pete, I, I know we only have uh, about four minutes left before we have to wrap up the top of the hour with uh, contact information, etc. But I did want you just, and this is uh, off the fly, but I know you're going to be able to answer it. I wanted you just to reiterate the, um, the rationale behind um, pigments and skin uh, melanosis, pigments that are formed in the skin, whether they be uh, benign, precancerous or cancerous, and how that effect um, of that cell change can be mitigated with um, progesterone, uh, given that um, the estrogenic stimulation uh, with that area can certainly be a trigger for uh, carcinoma. Um, uh, yeah, the, the tanning process uh, is probably related to uh, the, the formation of, of molds and melanomas. Uh, the injury done to the cell by ultraviolet light, uh, you can create tanning uh, by practically any kind of injury to the skin, not just ultraviolet light, but uh, it's a reaction to injury. And so when uh, cells are being injured, for example, by a, a progesterone deficiency, uh, stressed by stimulator substances, such as estrogen or uh, uh, some of the nerve transmitter chemicals. Uh, the stress uh, reaction uh, creates a pigment as a defense because the pigment is a, a free radical scavenger. Um, and as, as long as you're producing uh, the pigment, it's uh, uh, defending itself against the free radicals. Uh, so the I think of, of moles as a, a defensive reaction. Uh, a famous Israeli uh, researcher, uh, Gershom Zaitchek, uh, has reviewed the, the evidence on uh, uh, melanoma surgery. Um, he says it's very common for when you remove one confirmed melanoma, often new ones will uh, pop up almost immediately after the removal. And he suggests that uh, the uh, uh, presence of one is uh, sending out signals that uh, suppress the formation of, of new ones. Okay, because there's definitely a bystander effect as well with uh, cancers, and there's definitely the uh, well-documented um, risk of spread uh, and or alarm alarm signals being spread that would then propagate that uh, uh, same uh, reproduction. Anyway, Dr. Pete, thank you so much for your time. We're coming up to a couple of minutes, so let me just, uh, the, the lights are buzzing with calls. Well, was there we'll anything else that. you wanted to say, Dr. Pete, before we close out the show? Uh, no, just that the, the bystander effect is uh, a, a vastly under-investigated yeah. subject. Yeah. It, it relates to radiation, yeah. estrogen, any kind of injury spreading it's, everywhere everywhere in the body. It's in the field of quantum mechanics, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks so much for your time, Dr. Thank Pete. you, Dr. Pete. Okay, thanks. Okay, so thanks uh, for those people that have called in, for those people that have listened and tried to call at the end of the show here. I'm sorry we didn't get to the phone. Um, there is a possibility here if you want to email. Uh, you can email uh, either me or Sarah. You can go ahead and email me, andrew at westernbotanicalmedicine.com if you have any questions that you didn't get a chance to ask, perhaps. Um, okay, so for those people that heard Dr. P and want to find out more about him, www.raypeat.com. 